like to carry on your pyro story, Steve? <laughs> Someone came down a spiral staircase. Gone what it was called already. Yeah. yeah. Lord, someone over there. Well, we're live, are we? We are live. Oh, right. Crikey. <laughs> I can't have forgotten what happened. Sorry, smashed I just the smashed the table. <laughs> and, yeah. What was it called? Lord Dunningham. Sounds about right. Yeah. Lord Dunningham came down the uh, spiral staircase, wasn't he? Barrow. <laughs> we sat there in the corner, painting the scene here. <laughs> And he said, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not really giving it the, yeah, I'll, I'll start again. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Poirot looked wistfully at the bay window as Lord Dunningham came down the spiral staircase. Wistfully. You gave me a shock there, Poirot, you little creep. <laughs> what are you... What are you doing staring at my bay window? <laughs> His holiness asked. <laughs> His holiness, Lord Dunningham. <laughs> I'm staring at the bay window, Lord Dunningham, because Lady Dunningham is <laughs> outside on the bowling green. <laughs> <laughs> what is she doing on the bowling green, Poirot? She's playing bowls, Lord Dunningham. <laughs> You stupid peer. I'm going to get the Agatha Christie estate on the phone now. <laughs> well, they probably happened. make it now. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Chapter two. <laughs> I suspect these episodes, the main episode and this bonus episode that has yet to actually start, would not be recommended for first-time listeners because they're both sort of started with an improvised Poirot story. Although I would quite happily listen to that for another half an hour. Hark, it's an 87th Precinct bonus episode. And if we were very serious in the last episode, the main episode, because the book was all about lots of people getting killed, at least we've done that now. (laughs) And if you've listened to the interview with Otto Penzler, who talked about Evan Hunter, Ed McBain, and what he was like, he liked laughing until he was crying with laughter. And so do we. So forgive us our sins there for indulging ourselves let's get back to the important stuff that we normally get up to in these bonus episodes more like book sniffing book sniffing book (laughs) huffing book sniffing galore i'm not even sniffing a book there just sniffing the air just warming up yeah just Just getting the hooter you know primed and ready to go whilst steve-o's nasal receptors are reaching peak temperature morgan perhaps you could describe the edition we've got of Ed McBain's 10 plus 1, the book we were discussing. Yeah, uh, so what we've got is we've got a picture of the wall just outside what we assume is the 87 Precinct Station with a, a globe with a big 87 on it. It's dripping blood, splattered with blood. Unfortunately, if you've actually read the book, you'll know that it's not a particularly accurate depiction of what the globe outside the 87th Precinct is meant to look like, because I'm pretty sure it's described as... Is it green with white lettering? Something like that. And I've always pictured it as being affixed to the front of a set of steps down rather than actually on the wall. But Absolutely. But, but yeah. It's yeah, it's 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 attached to a girder and it's covered in the brains of presumably David Cohen, one, one of the victims in the book. Poor old David. It's mm. the pan edition from nineteen seventy five. In fact, mine's the third edition. Well, that's a look. Ni- well, third printing, sorry, nineteen seventy nine. I will um, have a look. Just comparing. Me and Morgan have the same edition of this one. Um, uh, no, mine is actually the 1975 one, I think. Oh, so yours has got four-year pedigree on the line. And presumably then yours is like mine, dedicated to Herb Alexander. That's, Herbert that's Alexander, the fella. Who I think was one of his early publishers. Fair enough. Do you know what? I haven't got that to hand, even though I probably talked about it at some point. Oh. But Steve-O has got a pan edition, but it is from what year? Well, that's what I was just looking at, because this is 1975 also. Oh, all right, so they've changed... So they must have had a a mid-year change of cover. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Serious. So I assume yours is the earlier one, because if that's still being published in 1979... Mine's got a sniper rifle uh, that has a rope attached to the top of a chair, which I've seen in the movies some snipers do with a loose... Yeah. Uh, so you you kind of rotate yeah. the rifle to tighten it, gives you, it a, gives you good fixed position. Uh, yeah. But it looks like it's green to the point of uh, like a an olivey green, a dark green. 
but then it's gone brown on the back due to fading of uh, yours. Yours out of all of ours has got the most. Well, it, it looks the most bleak. lived. Yeah, bleak. it's, 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 it's led the it's a bit harder blo- life. It's a bit blotchy on the spine there. Somewhat weathered. But should we should we do a little snifter to Go see? Go on, give it a bit of a smell. Yours looks like it's probably got the best aroma. I don't know. It's it's not got the aroma one would. Ooh, it's <laughs> quite, quite ripe. Yeah, yours is um, sweeter. <laughs> Almost non-existent. Well, Morgan's wins hand down. Hand, uh, hands there down go. there. Well, mine's yeah. only thirty-nine years old, so it's, it's yeah. Thirty-eight. Mine costs one pound fifty, according to the sticker inside. Mine cost. I don't know because it hasn't got anything written on it. Um, mine, mine's a secret too. It's one ninety-five originally, allegedly. Okie dokie. Mine was eighty p. Oh, my, my must what? be a later edition then, this surely. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah, this is Yours has got a barcode on it as well. It doesn't Sorry, listeners, I feel that Morgan's been leading I've us yeah, up the this is, this is 40 pence. I've clearly fibbed, but it doesn't tell me anything about so being a later printing. Hmm. This edition published nineteen. I'll get to the bottom of this and I'll let you know. No, no later date on there. No, right, okay. Fair enough. Anyway, I'm going to... So, sorry. Yours didn't might to... be a, a super rare. I most assuredly did not mean to mislead... Anyone there, but it does have barcode. No I one's gonna buy that. us a coffee now. And, well, I don't blame them. It's very confusing. Mm. <laughs> we should probably have sorted this out off air, but never mind. Oh, no, it's, it's these sort of uh, spur of the moment discoveries that people tune in for, surely. Yeah, live book. 40 stuff. pence, 80, 80 pence, pence, one pound 95. Mine must pence. come out like the other week. <laughs> Yeah, it's yours is the only one with a barcode as well, and that's the clue. And none we of could them probably, We could actually... I'm not going to do it now, but we Canada. could find from, from out the from the ISBN. Yeah, absolutely. You've got an it, ISBN 13, not an ISBN 11. Some, somewhere in the 80s, definitely, but yeah, I'm not sure be. exactly where. Anyway, let's move away from All that. All illegal in Canada. Though. Yes, you can't buy these <laughs> in they, Canada. They, they share. The original cover on the Simon and & Schuster and Hamish Hamilton editions was uh, showing the gentleman Ooh, here. Can have a look at that? Mm. Is the one on the left or the one on the right? That's the hardback one there. Oh, nice. right. Oh, that's good. It's got like a... Um, a little tally chart. Tally yeah. chart plus really one. Possibly in blood. Nice. And then, oh my lord, that guy's... Yeah, look, and the other one yeah, that very... Steve was looking at is the paperback edition, the permaback. Permaback. It, it it looks, I think somebody's being shot in the street, but it looks more like he's having a very... Dramatic. It looks like he's swooning. Oh my someone. god! And holding his uh, the back of his hand to his forehead. I'll share pictures of all of these on our Instagram feed, so you can see exactly what they are. He's and if you've got any different editions, which many people do have, please share them as well with us. It does appear to have come over all the necessary that guy. He does, doesn't he? He looks as though he's had a bit of a um, funny turn. Yeah, someone needs to whip out the smelling salts. Book covers aside. I mentioned in the main podcast that it was adapted in 1971 oh. as a French film called Sans Mobile Apparent, Without Apparent Motive, starring... Oh, I've tried to say this before, mm-hmm. haven't I? Jean-Louis Tritignan as Stéphane Carella. Sasha Distel's in the film as well. Excellent. Stéphane Castille. Mm. And obviously I don't know anything about this film because I've not seen it. Mm. I can't even find a decent trailer for it. I could find one trailer, but it was dubbed into Catalan and cut to pieces. The interesting thing is, the score for the film is by Ennio Morricone. Ooh, so that's a big name, isn't it? It sure is. What year was this? 70... 71. Ooh. So this is classic Morricone yeah, territory, yeah, isn't it, for crime and thriller time. It was reviewed in the Washington Post in 1972, presumably when it came out in America, and there's not really much to say about it. It just sort of describes the process by which it was made... And, that, and that's it. Great review, that. Yeah, I know. It's one of those Correct. ones. Clearly, one of those ones where a press pack's turned up and yep. someone's just gone. He liked making detective films, so he made a detective film based on a detective book <laughs> in French. The end. The end. But like I say, hopefully, I'll get a copy of it and we can actually watch it and give you a that bit will, more detail that about would it. Be quite interesting. I, that, yeah, I, I was thinking whilst reading it, I'd like to see a, a movie adaptation of it. I think it could be a corker. You always get great credits in French films, don't you? You get the beginning, you know. Mm. Well, I think there's a swathe of sort of 1970s films mm. where you get really good credits. I mean, one of my favourite films is Dirty Harry, and I mm. think in terms from what I've seen of the little bit of without apparent motive, the the tiny little bit of footage I've seen of it, it looks very much in that. 
mm. mould that idiom, big broad sweeping shots of cities yeah. with the titles coming up over that and that sort of era appropriate soundtrack as well. Tremendous. Well, Dirty Harry is a sniper in it. It very much does. Yeah, sniper. Sni- sniper meets Zodiac Killer. Yes, it's a good film, Dirty Harry. I like it very much. I reckon we've got a few things to talk about in terms of films because we had a question from one of our listeners, our friend, Dr. Andy Davies, one of the different Andrews who listens to this. <laughs> and he says that he was watching Heat, the Michael Mann film, the other night. Oh, all right. I've never seen Heat. Mm, uh, some I've years ago. For a long time, yeah. Lots of mumbling goes on in that <laughs> film. Well, he says he thinks he would be a good director for an 87th Precinct adaptation. Oof. Because he thinks that because he'd be good at shooting the city and the various characters' personal mm. lives, but but perhaps less good at the procedural elements. Mm. And you know, would we would we have a director in mind who we'd choose to direct a film Ooh. of it? We keep getting asked questions about adaptations, but it's it's so hard to pin it down because very often Ooh. the people who are best at making something are the people you least expect to be doing it. That's also very true. The obvious choice is very is very often you know not the best choice. I don't really know many Michael Mann films. I must be brutally honest about this. No, I'm. I'm, I, I, I'm not sure what I've seen of his apart from. Well, I wrote actually. down a list of some of the the main ones that I think people would know. He, stu- you know, he did a thing called The Thief in 1981. No. Manhunter in 1986. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's the. Um... Is that a crimey one? Sounds crimey. What? Crime esque Manhunter. Is that a crime based? Is, isn't the, Manhunter the the the, 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 the um... Silence of the Lambs? Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes yeah. Uh, Last oh, of the Mohicans, oh, right, 92. Yep. Heat, 95. The Insider, 99. I've seen that, yeah. The big screen version of Miami Vice in 2006. Not and too well regarded, no. as, um, as far as I'm aware. Public Enemies in 2009. Oh, that, yeah, that, I've seen that, yeah. yeah. That's all right. I'm it, waiting to see that. I know it's on Netflix. I think I'd prefer to see uh, somebody like Sam Peckinpah in the director's seat. So imagine all the slow mos as uh, you know, all the actions happening in the Well, as the room. blood splattered over the 87th Precinct globe on the yeah. steps, it be would good be good for, the, good for this one particularly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, imagine all the slow mos of the, uh, the sniper shots. It would be gruesome. It would. So I just don't know who you can choose. Really. See, uh, all, all those 70s uh, like Eastwood films, such as Dirty, Dirty Harry. Harry, that was Alan Pakula, was it? Not. So, yeah, he'd be very good, I think. Yeah. Getting that uh, atmospheric, paranoid that, kind of... That's the kind of thing you're going to go for, yeah. Or William S- Freakin. Um, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah we'll, super we'll... widescreen, so where the picture's yeah. sort of big and wide, but it's also quite intense and small. Because it's crushed and, down and you yeah. can really focus in. Well, it's still sort of that kind of grainy, big. dirty kind of like atmosphere of the city. Yeah. Well, yeah. the French Connection must be. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Set that's in same. New York, and that's like. Yeah. That's yeah. So I, I could see that being good. And he's, he's still making some good movies too. So I mean, that would be a possibility. It, it would depend what you wanted to bring out most from the novels. So it would probably depend which book you were looking to adapt. Because some of them you're going to want to emphasise more of the character-driven stuff and more of the humour. Some of them you the, that kind of action element is going to be more essential. Always you're going to want to capture the city. So and this know. is perhaps why it would work as a TV series now mm. in a way that it didn't in the 60s when it was very studio lot bound and you couldn't in the city didn't feel like the city mm. which is I think one of the reasons the 87 Precinct TV series fails is because all they can do is have small small cast small sets small places where it needs to be small cast big places what about your favourite director, Michael Bay? He could do it. My favourite director, <laughs> Michael Bay. That's slander and I'll take you to the courts of any land in order to destroy that. Michael Bay loves explosions and armies and he's an atrocious director. Army of detectives. Well, yes, and that's... some of the books have explosions, so it would wheel him out for the odd one. It wouldn't be a sniper if it was Michael Bay. What it would actually be was an Apache AH-64 would fly over a building... Blow the park to pieces, and then um, and some underwear model would turn up for no apparent reason. Yeah. Even though it's a kids' film, oh, I'm getting distracted there. Oh, fantastic! Oh. Yeah. Transformers and my heart. Oh. Never mind. Let's so, move on. I just yeah. don't know. I just don't know enough directors to sort of to sort of say. But I think you're sort of right in the sense of that 1970s vibe. 
And maybe when we get the chance to see the French adaptation, it might do the job very mm. well. But do these films get that nitty gritty of the interaction in the squad room? Do they get enough chance to grow the characters That's that you love? True. This mean, is you... always the problem, isn't it? That's why a TV series might be better. It, well, it might well. Or, as you say, a completely unexpected director who might be a much better choice because they might bring out a lot more of that kind of interaction between the characters that you wouldn't necessarily get from someone who's going to be more focused on that sort of gritty action element. Yeah. So, mm. Too hard a question. Brian De Palma, he's, he's done a f- few films in like big cities, hasn't he? But uh, I think we'll go with William Friedkin actually yeah, so on the on the on the basis of French connection. Uh, only Brian De Palma if he's going to make it into a musical like Phantom of the Paradise. Okay. Eight seven three sync the musical. I could go for that. Ooh, yeah. well, keep that in mind. Coming to Ooh. a off Broadway stage near you yeah. soon. Well, near you if you're near off Broadway. I imagine this is something that could spark some debate, so we will put this out as a separate question on the Twitter feed, and it'd be interesting to know, because we speculated about actors who could play the characters, but we never really thought about who could be the ideal director from history to do this. On the subject of films, one of the things I was talking about on the Twitter feed was, I keep finding new adaptations of Killer's Wedge. (laughs) And I say new, I mean old. Mm. And the one that I discovered was a thing called Kyofu no Jikan, which translates as, or I discovered it translated as Fright Time. <laughs> but I think Time of Fear is a better it's translation. A bit, rather so. than Fright Time, yeah. which sounds a little bit, like, a little ghosts! Bit like, a little bit like Fright Night, yeah. yeah. And that was made in 1964 by Toho. Terrific. Who, of course, the year before, had made High and Low. Mm-hmm. Which, Ooh, we need to see this. Yeah, well, I'm hoping to get Which hold. one was this? Killer's Wedge? Yeah. Killer's Wedge, which is where the lady with the so, nitroglycerin turns oh, up. Yes. Very much so like the... Squad Room Bound in the book, mm. and when they'd expand it out to try and bring in a bit more... I just have a feeling that the, the reason they would have made this is that High and Low was obviously had come out and been a massive mm. success, and they bought the rights to a different one. Yes. Yeah. And they thought, we'll turn this out as well, we want to sort of capitalise on the... That would make sense. ...on the sort of crime boom... But Kurosawa's not directing it. No. And, well, the fact that I could barely find any information out about it, even in, like, one of the ultimate textbooks about Toho's outputs, there's a reference to it, and that's it. But So it took a bit of searching, and thank God for Google Translate. Bizarre (laughs) as it makes things sometimes, at least I could find out a little bit more about it. I found out that, in in terms of high and low, it's got in common, the lighting guy is the same one. Mm. So that's a good bet, because the lighting in high and low is amazing. It's terrific. And the guy who played the villain in High and Low, the actual main oh, villain, yeah. plays, I think, plays one of the main detectives in this. All oh, right. And someone else who was in High and Low is in this as well. Hmm. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I'd love yeah, to see how they they dealt with another McBain from the same picture house, from the same production company, yeah. only a year later. But then I was looking at that and I was doing a bit of research and I, and I also found out that there had been a Russian adaptation of it in 1993. <laughs> Amazing. Of which, where's my piece of paper with that on? Oh, my Lord. Good Lord. The paper is missing. Is it on the other oh, side? Have I, done this, have I printed this double side? I haven't. Oh. But anyway, there's a, yeah, there's a Rus- Russian adaptation, Russian-Ukrainian adaptation from 1993. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, how many more adaptations of, of Killer's Wedge can there be? So now I reckon it's probably the most adapted 87th Precinct wow. story. Whereas before, I think it was King's Ransom, mm. but these two add on to it. And plus, I think there was another Japanese TV version in the <laughs> late 90s, early 2000s I can find no information about. And so that's really interesting. Yeah, that, amazing. That's cropped up as well. I would love to see some of these. I think the Russian-Ukrainian version is basically a complete adaptation of the book, including both threads of story as well. Oh, wow. So I'd like to see that. that would Especially be an early 90s TV movie from Russia or Ukraine. I, oh, I bet that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, you've I can to find some it, pictures, so. and again, I'll, I'll link to those on the blog. <laughs> so that's interesting, isn't it? Mm, it is. is. I did find a blog someone had written about watching the Japanese adaptation, <laughs> and it was sort of done in couplets. Oh, and as not rhyming couplets, just little mini phrases, sort of quite enigmatic as, okay. as Japanese writing can yeah. appear to be. And I've I've highlighted a couple in tiny tiny writing that you might want to read out. Perhaps Stevie, Co- you'd like to read. A, someone has said while they were watching this film. All right, okay. I slip my mouth and tensions runs in the room during the play. Oh. Yep. Some name there. 
Yamazaki does not reveal his name, so he. <laughs> hmm. The criminal steal the eyes of the criminal outside the window with a handgun. Because there is a man with nitro. A man with nitro? I think that's a mistranslation. Uh, the, the other police. And, um, <laughs> well, those last ones that I've highlighted there, why have I highlighted them? Feel like, feel like barking like the beast of Yamazaki Tsutomo, crazy eyes. If there is space, trying to jump to Yamazaki, Kurobi Susumu. Mm. It's good, isn't it? Makes you want to see it. It, it is good. It, it's it's got, got the feel of some of uh, Ezra Pound's images works. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't want to show off, fellas, but you know, I was in New York recently. I don't know whether I mentioned it. No, not at all. No, uh, I wasn't aware of that. So I went to the mysterious bookshop and met Otto and stuff like that. And you, you know, I'd, you'd give me a list of things to keep an eye out for in the mysterious bookshop. Now, I've only got so much money, fellas. So. <laughs> but I did buy you a present each. It's oh, not Lord. this. I'll talk about this in a second. Don't touch that. Don't put it near any beer. Oh, crikey. So I've got you a book each. I've got you a paperback from the mysterious bookshop each. Morgan, this is for you. Perhaps you could tell all the... Ladies and gentlemen, what it is I've bought you as a present? Look at this. Anthony Boucher, the case of the seven sneezes. Excellent. I couldn't um, resist. Right, that, that, that's a, a great title. I also love the cover. This is amazing. It's a green door mystery. Death from the past means murder tomorrow. Super tense. Startling. Pungent. Yeah. So but I bet it review. is pungent that I would book imagine as well. it is pungent. Get my oh, nose look at him anyway. Well. That's and fantastic. That's Anthony Boucher, who we talk about so often because of his reviews. Terrific. Uh, it's nice to know like who we're actually talking about. As a brief synopsis, murder coming. Detective Fergus O'Brien can smell it. The tangled loves and hates, the isolated island, the twenty five year old mystery haunting them all. Everything points to murder within hours. Only one question remains who'll kill who? Ooh. Oh, oh my, my goodness. God. Is he as good at writing books as he is at writing reviews? Can I have a guess? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Who reviews the review? Ooh, he, look, he, looks, he looks a bit shifty, doesn't he? <laughs> he looks a bit shifty. <laughs> That's no way to talk about one of our number one uh, McBain boosters. Yeah. Pungent is right. He, he's, you have a, you have a sniff at that. I, I just did. It's uh, it's It's good. Right, well... It came off a special shelf in well, the you'll, shop. Well, you'll be having seven sneezes if you... <laughs> so, like, in a bargain for 50 cents originally. What year was this? Let's see. Pyramid Edition published December 66. Fantastic. 66. All right, and for Steve-O, oh, uh, I, I don't think you've got this, Steve-O. There's a risk that you might have, but I well, don't think you have. Well, let's just... And roll, this is for you. Roll with it. Oh, thank you. Ooh, the, the American rivals of Sherlock Holmes. Crikey. Yeah, edited and introduced by Hugh Green. And I think that's Huey Green, the person from oh, BBC TV. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well. Mm-hmm. Steve has just sort of made an amazing <laughs> noise. Well, just trying the to... sound of reading <laughs> without he, saying has anything. Has he written them all then? Oh, no. is it's, it's a collection, a, I think. It's a collection of um, short stories of. The equivalents of the sort of potential. Mm. I think Penguin did a few things like this because I've got a, a, the Forgotten Rivals of Sherlock Holmes collection which i think yeah. is from around the same oh, well, era. I, think, yeah, I think there was a collection there's a thing called the right the rivals of yeah. sherlock holmes there's the american rivals there's presumably this one that you've had mm. there was a tv series called the rivals of sherlock ah, holmes so maybe which was also... one-off mysteries based on these other authors writing around the same they time or in the same way they span off a few things from that but yeah that was certainly all things that you've definitely not heard of but which have all seem kind of fascinating i haven't read it yet but it's uh, there on the shelf Cool, well, thank you very much. Ah, Only 13 stories takes place between 1898 and 1915, the era of glowing gaslights and lavishly appointed trains, when the automobile was only a curious novelty. Thank you very much. So that's come Fantastic. all the way from the America. Ah, the Americas. What year was that published then, Steve? 1976. 76. Ten years apart. Ten years between a sneeze and a rival. <laughs> And so the books, 1914, 1911, 1939, yeah, so the books themselves spread a, 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 right, a right old age. Mm-hmm. I did treat myself oh, quite well, right, so. uh, intensely while I was in America. <laughs> now, I went to a few good bookshops in New York. One was called uh, Strand Books, which has 18 miles of books in it. And I did spend a bit of money on Evan Hunter stories there, non-87th Precinct mm. ones. 
But when I was in the mysterious bookshop, I treated myself to a couple of Evan Hunter bits and a couple of other bits, including this one called Barking at Butterflies and Other Stories, which is credited to Evan Hunter, a.k.a. Ed McBain, <laughs> and cost me a bit of money. Yeah. And it cost me a bit of money because it's signed by both <laughs> Evan Hunter and Ed McBain. Amazing. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so he signed it as both of his... Tremendous. Both of his names. <laughs> And it's a collection of short stories. Oh, great that stuff. I'm just... Oh. That's... Yeah, that's... A pretty Signed name. by him. Have you read it yet? No, I'm not read Jack it yet. Have a, uh, you can have a look at it as long as you don't breathe on it too hard. It's a, a pretty terrific thing to own. Mm. But I did also treat myself to one other signed thing by Ed McBain, and that was a copy of Bread in Hardback. Ooh. Cool. Which was the first thing I saw that I could afford. <laughs> I was like, I'm getting that, even though I've got it already. Nah, it's, it's definitely mm, worth having. Nice. Thank you very much. It's got a nice picture of uh, later Aaron, uh, later Aaron, later <laughs> era Evan on the front there, looking yeah. sort of wistfully out from yeah, beside a concrete post of some sort. And then it would appear that the typeset has gone a little bit crazy when uh, printing the title. Yeah, there's quite a few fonts on there. Yep. It was done in uh, the year 2000. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a few fonts on the cover. The uh, desktop publishing guy obviously got quite excited by the range of opportunities that yeah. he was afforded. Considered the word at to be particularly vital for everyone <laughs> to read there. It's very big. It's written very big. But I'm very much looking forward to reading it. I'm going to move uh, my beer away from it now, right now. Good plan. Oh, that's okay. tremendous. So there we go. Exciting stuff. Exciting stuff. So we've talked about our book covers for this 8 7 precinct we've been looking at. We've talked about the movie adaptation. We've talked about other movie adaptations. We've pondered on the question of directors. I think all that really remains for us to say is if you've tolerated and enjoyed the rubbish that we've talked in this bonus episode particularly, we do like a rating, a review, or a share on social media. If you feel the need to buy as a virtual coffee, then we'd appreciate that very much. It'll go into a special pot for making everything better. And <laughs> just... I couldn't think of anything else to say there. <laughs> but otherwise, we'll be back very soon with a review of the next book in the 87th Precinct series, which is called Axe. And I'm going to say goodbye, and so are the others. <laughs> At some point, <laughs> goodbye. And goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>